So in the last couple of videos, we've been looking at majority and minority influence within a group situation. What we're gonna to do to today though is go a little bit more into how does it happen? Because if you look at Sharif's work, if you look at Ash's work, Moscovici's work as well, they tell you that people are influenced by others, whether it's a majority or a minority. It doesn't quite explain how. What we're gonna to do today is we're gonna look at a model called the dual process model put forward in 1955 by Deutsch and and Gerard, and they suggest that there are two ways that this social influence works, normative social influence and informational social influence. The way you can categorize between the two is you would say that normative social influence is more wanting to be liked by the group and therefore developing the public norms of the group and your behaviors. Whereas informational social influence is more about wanting to be right and therefore it's using the information from the group to change what you're thinking to then be more right. If you look at uh, some of the studies we've already discussed, uh, in Sharif's autokinetic effect, people are using informational social influence because it's an ambiguous task. They don't know how much the light is moving, uh, but equally nobody else in this situation knows any more than them. So you would assume uh, that pooling together all of the resources, uh, you're building up your knowledge base and therefore you're more likely to be right. Therefore, you're looking at informational social influence there. On the other hand, if you look at Ash's study where it's quite obvious that the lines are longer or shorter, and yet a third of participants gave the incorrect answer because that's what the rest of the group said. Well, in that case, we're looking at normative social influence and the desire to be liked by the rest of the group to fit in with the rest of the group. Now, how is it that we can test whether we're looking at one or the other form of social influence? And the answer to this is to look at that third stage of those experimental designs, which is where they take the participant back out of the group environment and into a solo condition again. So the experiments tend to start with a solo condition to test that the person understands the task and what do they do when they're uninfluenced by other people. Then you move into the group situation and you see how do their behavior change or not change because of the role of the group. And then you take them back out of that situation, back into a private setting. And then the question is, did whatever they've learned from the group, whatever they demonstrated when they were in the group setting, did that stay? And if it stayed, then it's more likely to be informational influence. If it didn't stay, if it was just a public behavior that wasn't internalized, then it was more likely to be normative. Now at this point, it's m probably worth bringing in someone else into the fray. Turner, in 1987, gave us something new and he gave a self-categorization theory. Now this explains why uh, this form of social influence isn't a blanket process. Why aren't we all influenced in the same way where we're given the same information? And we're not. And he suggests that this self-categorization model comes into it. In order to be influenced by the information, a person has to have a relationship to the group from which the information is coming from because they will have an individual desire or lack of desire to identify as a member of that group and therefore uh, will have uh, the corresponding interest in the information being given by the group. To put this into a, an experimental example, uh, Boyanowski and Allen in 1973 demonstrated that racially prejudiced people, so racist people, were more likely to be persuaded of something by a white person than by a black person. Even when the information was exactly the same, they were more likely to be persuaded by the group that somebody was perceived to be a member of, in this case, a racial group. Another example would be if we use uh, the Sharif autokinetic effect. You're in the group situation, you've got the pinprick of light in this darkened room, and you're asked to predict how far it moves. And you think it might move a couple of inches. The person next to you says, I don't think it's a couple of inches, I think it's half an inch. But just so that you know, I'm visually impaired and I can't actually see it. In that instance, you're going to say, well, I don't think your information that you're providing me in this instance is as useful. And so I'm not going to incorporate that information into my understanding. 
because I don't consider your information to be relevant right now to this example. And so we're constantly doing this according to Turner and he suggests then that instead of normative information we should split to a unified model. So get rid of the distinction. No normative, no informational, but instead a referent informational influence. The informational influence is dependent on the reference group from which it came. What Turner has been able to do is to suggest why does it work for some people in some situations and not others, whereas it works for other people in other situations, but not this one. And there'll be more videos on the way. So if you like this one, if you found this one helpful uh, in preparation for your exams or whatever else you're, you're looking into psychology for, uh, then please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel so that you get told when the next videos are out and you can watch them. Uh, and uh, if you've got any comments, I'd love to see them down below and I will reply to all of them.